Hi everyone, my name is Malus Peters and you might have seen a previous video where I gave a brief introduction to bioreactors and where I explained that what's fundamentally different in a bioreactor is that you're working with a catalyst which is alive. So this could be an enzyme, a bacteria, a virus and so on. Now today we'll go into a little bit more detail on what type of bioreactors there are uh, starting with the most common one and then showing a couple of other examples. And then we'll talk about how they are applied in certain design specs that you might want to consider. Uh, the first one is by far the most common type and this is a stir tank reactor <coughs> which can be either operated and batched or in continuous. And it will depend on the system that you use what your preference would be. Now the advantage of this is this is very easy to construct and to maintain. And the key thing that it has in there is that it's got an agitator or a type of impeller that is used for mechanical mixing. Now, depending on the system that you work with, you probably want to pick a different type of impeller because they work in different ways. And if you're working with an aerobic culture, you would have a sparger, which is used to supply the oxygen. And then the impeller will make sure that uh, both the oxygen and the nutrients are properly mixed. Now, it would also keep the substrate um, well controlled. It's very easy to control the pH and temperature. But one of the things that can be a problem in bioreactors, that even though this is a very simple design, is that this mechanical mixing can create some shear stress, which is harmful to certain microorganisms. So you will see there are some different types of reactors that therefore use other ways of mixing cell cultures. Now, the, the second one is not very common at all. So this is an airlift reactor. And as the name kind of implies that the air with, that you've got within the reactor lifts all the components and therefore ensures that you've got mixing. So it's a type of pneumatic kind of mixing where you can see there's a hollow tube on the inside and that you will see that the airflow is like this. So they're being pushed up and by that movement you create so that mixing is happening and it will come down through that. Very simple design. And a very big advantage here is that you don't need to use any mechanical mixing, unlike the stir tank reactor that we previously used. Now, the main advantages of this is that you then avoid a substantial shear, shear stress. And also you're working in a relatively uh, high oxygen transfer rates. So this is very suitable for aerobic cultures and for cells that are shear sensitive. So in bear in mind, for instance, um, a a very well-known example of this was the production of corn. So for instance, when you looked at fungi, uh, but also other cells like, for instance, mammalian cells, these are the ones that are accessorily uh, susceptible to shear. This is also very simple to scale up. All you would do is you would simply make it longer. Um, but the problem is that as soon as you start to kind of increase the height, and you will see that um, these reactors always have a disengagement zone where it kind of ends up being a bit wider in the top so that the gas has a bit of space there. There is also a part where the cells are going to be without oxygen and that's where they kind of come down. So you would need to take that into account on the type of cell culture that you're working with uh, and whether they're actually able to, um, to cope with that length of that downcomer. Now, the gas holdup is the volume fraction of the gas in comparison to the total volume. And this is very important when you consider, for instance, the bubble size and gas velocity. So these are also other things that you need to consider for your design. And in general, there are two uh, very uh, common ways of having a type of, of airlift reactor, which can involve either an external loop or you can have baffles in there in order to also promote uh, the transfer within the reactor. And the most common uh, example that people know, or the, the largest one that was built before, was by ICI Chemicals. And since I'm based in Newcastle, this was fairly local technology, which was then used for the production of corn. And the third reactor we're talking about is a photobioreactor. And, and this can be both using sunlight, so you could have a system which is open, but you could also have a closed system where you use artificial light. So you could culture, for instance, and this is typically used for so photosynthetic cultures, or for instance, algae or cyanobacteria. You could have, even if you have an open pond system outside, you would be able to culture them. But the advantage of kind of bringing it in a close, uh, in a closed system and using artificial light is that you can really increase the production. 
But as you can imagine, that will also come to extra costs. And also the control of this is not necessarily easy. And these reactors have to be made of a transparent material, such as plastic or glass, because you can imagine that the light has to pass through the reactor itself. Now, you want to use this for culturing of, for instance, as I said, algae. So sometimes you can be concerned about the biomass, but there's also instances where you're more interested in, in the metabolites or the secondary products um, that these cultures produce, such as, for instance, hydrogen. So there's multiple uh, reasons or multiple products that you can get using this approach. Now, as I then said, if you use like a closed system that comes with additional investment, additional costs, um, and it's harder to control. But given that, you know, they normally should be operated at relatively like temperatures 25 to 40 degrees, they do act as kind of a type of solar panels if they would be outside uh, because it is transparent and um, it would kind of catch a lot of light. So overheating, uh, particularly if this is outdoors, can be a big problem. So the cooling system has to be very carefully considered if you work with photobioreactors. And you can have them in lots of different types of designs. You could have them like in a tubular type of design. You've also seen examples of like a Christmas tree or it kind of literally looks like a tree like this. Uh, but this is the, the kind of general process of how this works. Now, for type number four and five, you will see that they are closely related. Uh, and I'll start off with the packed bed uh, bioreactor. Now, what you do in that case, and this is when you're working with solid particles and you have a normal packed bed reactor, which most people will know. But obviously, since we're working in a bioreactor, we have to think of a biocatalyst here. And these are fairly commonly used, much more commonly used in, for instance, an airlift reactor. Uh, when you look at, for instance, absorption, stripping processes, uh, or oxidation of chemicals in wastewater, and you will see that the reaction will occur at the surface of the catalyst uh, that you've then got in the reactor. And because of the way this is operated, you relatively have a high conversion of the catalyst, and you're also able to work under quite high temperatures and high pressures. And you can operate it mainly in two different ways. Uh, using it in a submerged mode or in a trickle flow mode, which you see kind of in the image here. And you can see the catalyst is tightly packed in, in, in it here, and you will make sure that it passes through. Uh, and then the contact with the catalyst, uh, that's really important in order to make sure that your reaction effectively happens. And these systems are very well described, and most people would have like uh, the typical chemical engineering books, like when Vogler, you can find the reaction rates and mass transfer in there in order to describe uh, this particular system. Now, one of the things you have to consider here that it has to move through a packed bed. So the pressure job is a very considerable challenge. Um, and also the cleaning of this is not straightforward. And you might experience some type of clogging or um, you know that the material is no longer to pass through. So high conversions, but this does have some particular uh, drawbacks, which is why people also used um, a fluidized bed bioreactor, which then automatically fills in as the next type of bioreactor we'll briefly be looking at. And there will be seven bioreactors in total that I will describe. Now, what you've seen here is in the previous one, we could see that they really had to kind of push it through the catalyst. So it was tightly packed within the columns. So this is similar in a way, but you would be looking at much smaller uh, particles and not kind of as tightly packed. They could just be moving through there. Uh, and a very considerable advantage of this then is that you avoid problems with clogging. So there is less problems with it being able to move through the catalyst, but in that regard, it also means that you need a much uh, bigger volume in that sense, um, and that the efficacy does kind of be somewhat lower than you would expect in a packed bed. So these, these fluidized beds, um, besides bioreactors, they're also very commonly used in other types of processes. So for instance, production of a variety of polymers and rubbers, uh, and the advantage of this system is that it's really easy to regenerate the catalyst, unlike what you've seen in the packed bed system. So I mentioned before that you need a relatively larger volume because they're not uh, packed quite as tightly as we had before. 
because they are moving around, so unlike where they were fixed, you do end up eroding the vessel. So in terms of maintenance, it will need more regular maintenance and might mean more wearing and tear of your equipment. Um, and the separation of the particles sometimes can be a little bit tricky as well. So both the pack bat and the fluidized bed are quite commonly used. Number six might be one of the most common designs that you will see because this is even simpler than a stirred tank reactor in this essence. This is a bubble column bioreactor. Um, and where this is different, remember that we still had a sparger in a stirred tank reactor where the bubbles were going in. Unlike in a stirred tank reactor, remember there in the stirred tank you had an impeller which made sure that you had mechanical mixing to ensure that the nutrients and both the oxygen were spread appropriately across your reactor. Now, this is different in a bubble column uh, because obviously you don't necessarily have, uh, you know, you have different types of mixing. So you don't have mechanical mixing occurring in that sense. So therefore the, the rheological properties of gas and liquid are very important. And that also means that if you would work with something which is relatively more viscous as a liquid, you wouldn't be able to do this because remember, you don't have this impeller in order to make sure that this uh, mixing happens. And therefore, it can be very important to promote the mixing within the reactor, to install some baffles or some plates to ensure uh, that there is appropriate mixing uh, within the bubbles. And these are typically cylindrical vessels, as you would see. So no impeller, so an even easier, simpler design. But because we don't have that observable mixing occurring, it, it's harder to control the parameters such as the temperature and the pH in there. And as I mentioned before, it really depends on the type of liquids that you're working with. So it might not necessarily be suitable uh, for certain liquids with high viscosity. Now this is the final type of bioreactor I'm going to talk about. I do have a separate video on uh, perfusion bioreactors if you're interested in this. Okay, so do have a look at that one if that's something that you want to consider. Right, here you see an example of the, the final type that I'm briefly going to mention, which is a membrane bioreactor. And then this one is by far mostly used in wastewater treatment. Um, but you've also seen that sometimes it is used for food and biofuel production. The scale up of this is a really simple process because as you can see in the image here, you simply just add extra bundles. So it's a modular unit, you add more of what you want. Now this for the wastewater, very important that you can recirculate the water. So that does mean that it has a lower environmental uh, footprint, which is important to consider for these applications. Now, similar to a packed bed, imagine that you have to make sure if you've got the membrane um, that one of the main problems you can occur that there's clogging of it. And um, here the advantage would be since you might be working with a lot of different tubes. So if there's one that's not working, this might not be such a problem. But the maintenance can be quite tricky. And also the problem here is that if you wanted to use the membranes, it does come with a relatively high initial capital investment cost. Now, this was a brief overview of different types of bioreactors. And if you do want to more know more about the work that we do in bioreactors, uh, then please have a look at the playlist, which will give you more information on particular topics. Thanks for watching.